you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Acts chapter 25. We continue our study in this wonderful book. We have been studying verse by verse uh, each of these books for the last year, I think. And we are almost at the end. We have about five, um, we, sorry, not, yeah, there's about four weeks left, and then we finish the, the book of Acts. The book of Acts records five times when Paul made a public defense of his faith in Christ. He defended himself before the crowd at Jerusalem, before the Sanhedrin. And in Acts chapter 24, we saw Paul give a defense before the, the Roman governor, Felix. And last week, in the beginning of chapter 5, we saw the defense before the Roman governor, Festus. And today, starting in verse 13, we see the circumstances that lead to Paul's fifth trial before King Agrippa II. So today we're going to look and we're going to see three worldly views that oppose the resurrection and how we are to defend the resurrection. That is the title of my sermon this morning, Defending the Resurrection. So if you would stand with me, please, as we read from... Acts chapter 25, in respect to the Lord's word. Acts chapter 25, starting in verse 13. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accuser face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. This is, this is Festus speaking to Agrippa, chapter, verse 17. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. And when the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. So being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. Father, please, we ask that you would open our eyes. We ask that you would open our ears and our hearts to the truth of your word this morning. We believe, Lord, that your word is inspired. And we know, Lord, that it is profitable for our correction, for our training in righteousness. And we ask, Lord, please, that you would train us today. We ask, Lord, that we would conform to your word. We would conform to be more like Christ through the preaching of your word. We ask that the Spirit, Lord, would please help us to apply these truths today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts this morning be acceptable in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So a number of years ago, Oprah Winfrey, she said, I believe that there isn't just one way to heaven. All beliefs go to heaven. Well, unfortunately, this view is becoming more and more popular today. You've probably heard something like that in your workplace or something similar in your college or even in your school. I'm sure you've heard people say to you, it doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you are sincere. And that really is the same sentiment as Oprah Winfrey's statement. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere because we all go to heaven anyway. All roads lead to Rome or all the rivers reach the sea. What it's saying, basically, is that it doesn't matter if you are a Hindu, it doesn't matter if you are a Muslim, it doesn't matter if you are a Christian, it doesn't matter if you are a Buddhist. As long as you are sincere in your beliefs and you are strong in them, that's all that matters. 
It's saying that everybody goes to heaven. And so they are all the same anyway. It's trying to say that we are all equal, so all of our beliefs are right. And no one group is right and no one group is, is wrong. But this view has many problems. And we will see this unfold in our passage this morning. Our text reveals two views of the resurrection. We see the world's view and we see the biblical view. We see the Christian view. My first point this morning, we see the arrival of King Agrippa in verse 13 and verse 14 as the story starts to unfold. Look there with me. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king. Now let me introduce the characters and then we will start to see the, the plot unravel here. In these verses we see King Agrippa's um, grandfather was Herod the Great. This is the same Herod that tried to kill Jesus as a baby. And in the process, he slaughtered thousands of other babies. This is the same Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded. So this King Agrippa that we are introduced to in verse 13, his father had, had martyred the first apostle James, and he had Peter put in jail. But we also introduced to Bernice. This is his wife. Now Bernice was not just his wife, Bernice was Agrippa's sister. And secular history records that their relationship was incestuous. And Agrippa and Bernice are one of the most infamous relationships of all history because they were brother and sister. Bernice, her first husband, was, was her uncle, to add on top of that. Bernice left him, divorced him, and then she became the mistress of the emperor Vespasian and was also immorally involved with his son, um, who was Titus, the emperor who destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. So she was not a moral woman at all, but she flipped back and forth between different men. But here in our passage, we see her with her brother Agrippa. And King Agrippa didn't rule over a lot of territory. Even though Agrippa was, was the king, they called him the king, he was, a, he was a, a vassal king. He was to that land what King Charles is to, to Great Britain. Um, there was a lot of pomp and a lot of ceremony, but, but not a lot of authority. Um, but nonetheless, he had influence because the Roman emperor had given him the right to oversee the affairs of the, the temple in Jerusalem and to appoint the, the high priest. So Agrippa was a nominal Jew. He wasn't a, a Roman. His authority was given to him by the Romans. And actually, Agrippa did not have jurisdiction over Paul in this particular case. But because he was known as, as a type of a, of a Jewish religious expert um, in their customs and in their different religious manners, Festus, who was a Roman, thought it would be a good idea for Agrippa to hear this case, to hear this, this matter, because he didn't understand all of it. Now, Paul is standing here before these men, before these worldly unbelievers, and what we see him doing is defending the, the Christian view of the, the resurrection. And really what we have presented to us is the world in all of its decadence, in all of its depravity, Versus Christianity here. And of course, especially the opposing views of the resurrection of Jesus. And what we see in the following verses are, are Festus's summary of the case to Agrippa. And this is really shop talk between these two rulers. But it really reveals to us the world's view of the resurrection. And I think it's still very relevant today. But notice as we read the summary how how inconsequential or how unimportant or how insignificant the world views the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, 
There is a man left by left prisoner by Felix. Remember back in chapter 24, verse 27, it says that Felix left Paul in prison because he desired to do the Jews a favor. That's the only reason he was in prison. He's been in prison for two years now. He's been on trial four times and he's been found innocent. But he was left in prison by the, the previous governor, and now Festus has taken over, but he was left there to do the Jews a favor. That's the only reason he, we have. He was innocent. They were just really trying to pacify the Jews. And Festus, what, what we have here, he is an inherited problem. He never put Paul in prison, but he has inherited this problem. And he goes on to explain to King Agrippa that the Jews want Paul dead, and they wanted to kill Paul with, without a trial. And he even confesses that there wasn't any accusation that stood. He says the only thing that Paul had done is he's in an argument about religion. And you can almost imagine him trying to explain this to Agrippa. And there's a dead man by the name of, of Jesus that, that he keeps saying is, is alive. Can you believe that? Can you believe that this, this guy is out of his mind? Why do they bother with him? I don't understand this. I don't understand this. Any intelligent Roman knows you don't rise from the dead. But he goes around affirming that Jesus is alive. Paul had been there for two years already. I'm sure he had been affirming that many times. If that's his particular strange thing, let him be. It's not going to hurt anybody. But I don't understand this. You see, he didn't understand that. He didn't understand anything. He didn't understand the implications of what Paul was saying, especially about the resurrection of the dead, especially about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He didn't understand the implications of the execution of this person that the Romans had put to death, the Messiah they called. He didn't understand the life and the work of Jesus Christ, he didn't even know this Jesus, this, this one Jesus that, that Paul kept on talking about. He doesn't even know who, who he is. And you can't expect Festus to understand anything. And of course, he's, he's trapped here in his ignorance. He's trapped here in his ignorance. He doesn't even understand why they're having this big debate. And all he knows is the thing is about the resurrection. That's, that's what he's concluded, and he's right. And Paul always got down to the core issue. And the core issue was that, that Jesus was not dead. Jesus was alive. And that's what we believe, amen? Jesus is alive. And the issue is always the resurrection. And so he, he calls to Agrippa, who, who is a Jew, and he says, I need your help. I don't know what's going on here, and it doesn't seem to be anything worthy of a, of a trial, especially before Caesar. But yet he's appealed to Caesar he wants to be in front of Caesar, and the people want him dead. Help me. Help me, please. So I want you to notice three opposing views here and how we can defend it and how we should be defending the resurrection of the dead. Look at verse 25. It tells us in verse 25, But I find that he had done nothing deserving death, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, or I decided to go ahead and send him. Here, the matter that the Jews accused Paul of were not of such crimes as he was expecting, as he says in verse 25. He thought it would be something really important, some matter of, of Roman law, but then he found out that it wasn't anything that important. And what he says, this is just some dispute about some dead man whom Paul says is alive. He says this is no big deal. And unfortunately, that's still the world's view of the resurrection, isn't it? When last did you hear any news report or any documentary about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Um, we hear all types of news. Not all of it gets onto the mainstream um, media. We hear news about, religious news about this, this house of Abraham being built on Sadiat Island. That may make the news. But that's, I think, just a human interest story, not really as substantial as everything else that's going on around us in this part of the world. 
But when last did you hear any news report about the resurrection, the resurrection of, of Jesus? The resurrection is a big deal. It has to be a big deal if we call ourselves Christians. Look at 1 Corinthians. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul argues that the whole Christian faith depends on our, on our understanding of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So in other words, if you want to discredit Christianity once and for all, what do you have to do? Disprove the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the foundation on which everything else rests. It's the domino that makes all other dominoes fall when it is pushed over. And Paul says that the, if the resurrection is not historically true, then you're wasting your time. I'm wasting my time. We're all wasting our times to be Christian. It's better to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. But if it is true, the resurrection of Jesus is the central fact of human existence. It's a central fact of human history, not some inconsequential event that can be ignored if we choose to ignore it. It means that He is the risen Lord and that He has claim on our life. And if the living Lord of the universe has a claim on your life, it is a big deal. It's not a small deal. Our second point we see is the resurrection, the world says, is a matter of private opinion. This is the world's view. Festus says in verse 19, back in Acts 25, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. We see in verse 20 that Festus, he was at a, he was at a loss how to investigate these matters. And basically what he is saying, it was the Jews' opinion against Paul's opinion, one religion against another religion. And since there's no factual way of deciding between one religion and another, what was I to do? What was I to do? And I think that's still the way the world, many people in the world view Christianity and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, it's your opinion. It's nice. You can have your opinion. I have my opinion. Let's not, let's not hurt each other. You have a right to your opinion. You can believe it if you want to, and, and I'll believe what I want to, and let's all get along. Let's all sing Kumbaya. Don't force your religious views on me. And after all, religion is just a private matter. It's just a private opinion, isn't it? Well, that's not what the Bible says. The resurrection is not a private a private opinion. It's not a matter of a private debate, but a fact that confronts every person. The resurrection confronts every person. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. When Paul was preaching in Athens, this is what he said. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Verse 31. Because he has fixed a day on, he, on, on which he will judge the, right, the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He has given the world assurance that a day of judgment will happen because he has raised Jesus from the dead. Folks, you see that? 
doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You will be judged because Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He didn't say, this is my opinion for those who care to accept this. He said, God is now declaring that all everywhere need to repent. Because one day all people will stand before the risen Lord Jesus Christ for judgment. And you'll give an account of whether you embraced this risen Lord or whether you rejected Him. You can't stand before the Lord and say, well, Lord, my parents believed in you. Isn't that good enough? And perhaps you're thinking, well, you know, that, that, that was Paul's opinion. That was Paul's opinion. But how do I know that this is true for, for everyone? And first, you need to realize that this isn't, this isn't just the Apostle Paul's opinion. This is Jesus' opinion. Look at John chapter 5. Look at John chapter 5 with me in your Bibles. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, that the Father has given all judgment to the Son in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. You must either accept the word of Jesus or you must reject it. There is no middle ground here, folks. It's not about, well, what is good for you is good for me. It's not like that. There is no middle ground. Either Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about and you need to accept it, or he was deluded and he was trying to deliberately deceive you and therefore you must reject it. But C.S. Lewis, he pointed out that there's, there's no room for this view that Jesus was a good moral teacher. C.S. Lewis says he was either a liar or a lunatic or he is Lord of all. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord of all. It would be a serious mistake to conclude that, that Jesus was mistaken on a few things, like eternal judgment. And unfortunately, there are preachers all around the world who try and dilute this truth from the Bible, that there is no judgment, that there is no hell. If they can take that away, then they can take other things away, isn't it, from the Bible? What does the Word of God say? What does the Word of God say? Well, the next worldview we see is that the resurrection is not true. It's not factual. And Festus uses a word for religion that can also mean superstition here in these verses. And the Greek word comes from two words, meaning to be afraid of a god or to be afraid of a demon, a superstition. And it implies that religion is not something that you can that you can verify. It's in the realm of the, the spirit world, in the realm of Narnia, or the realm of third or middle earth, not something that is real, not in the realm of reason or fact. And the world's view of Christianity has, has not changed much since then. Christianity is seen as just one of the religions of the world, no different than any other religion. All religions are a matter of faith. Nothing can be verified. There's no reason. There's no truth. The world says that evolution is science, but creationism is, 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 is faith. Even though they call evolution a theory, they say that is true. You know, Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and, and Judaism and Eastern mysticism and Christianity, take your pick or mix and match from any one of those, whatever you like. It has nothing to do with, with facts. That's what the world believes. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Look at verse 19 in chapter 25. In chapter 25, the resurrection, as we see, is based on factual, verifiable evidence. In verse 19, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. If you have a pen, underline that word in your Bible. Asserted. Paul asserted Jesus to be alive. Paul didn't say it might be true or that he hoped that it was true or that he believed it was true regardless of the evidence. 
he asserted it to be true. He wasn't presenting speculation or subjective religious ideas that, that warm the souls of those who are, are simple enough to believe. He was presenting testimony as an eyewitness of the risen Christ. And Paul had met the, the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And we know, we have testimony of how his life was changed and turned around. He had been a, a young, rising Jewish leader. Remember, he was intent on persecuting the Christians. He had a promising future. He had a good status in the community. He had a, a good living. But he gave that all up. When the risen Lord Jesus confronted him that day on the road to Damascus. Maybe you say, well, that could have been an hallucination. Many people have such mystical experiences. But what about the others? What about all the other disciples? What about the changed lives of all the other apostles? You know, they all were depressed kind of disappointed men who were, who were not expecting a resurrection. Remember that? They easily could have returned to their, their former occupations and they could have quickly slipped out of sight. They had nothing to gain. They had everything to lose by their testimonies to this resurrection. And because of their experience, they were willing to suffer beatings, they went to prison, and many were killed because of their testimony that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. You know, only one of the apostles never died an unnatural death, Apostle John. Every single one of them died at the hands of a sword. They were all men of honest character and integrity. They did not profit financially by asserting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They gave everything up. They gave up their lives to defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And why else would not only the 12, but Paul? And what about others? Thousands, hundreds of thousands give up their lives for this testimony. And this they knew based on the abundant eyewitness testimony that Jesus Christ was in fact risen from the dead. You know, if they were all deceived, if they were all deluded, you still have to explain the empty tomb, don't you? If Jesus' body had been in that tomb, as soon as the apostles began preaching the, the resurrection, the Jewish leaders could have produced the body and, and ended this foolish myth straight away. But clearly there was no body to be found because their body wasn't there. Jesus' body wasn't there. The tomb was empty. There is clear, compelling evidence that the, body, the bodily resurrection of Jesus is a fact of history. It's not a myth. And the Jesus who arose is not just a certain dead man, no different to other religions. He has risen from the grave, and He is alive. Amen? And the real issue is, is right here. Most people do not reject Christ because of a lack of evidence. The Jewish leaders in Jesus' day had plenty of evidence. People reject Christ because they don't want to turn from their sins. They don't want to turn from their selfish ways and acknowledge that they will face judgment by the one who has been resurrected from the grave. They want to cling to their pride that tells them that they are good enough to get into heaven by their, their own ways, their own works, and their pride convinces them that their good works will earn them favor with God. But the Bible declares that none of us by our works can earn a place in heaven. So how do you view the resurrection of Jesus this morning? How do you view the resurrection of Jesus? Have you put your faith in the most important fact of history, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead? Have you put your trust in Him as your Savior and Lord? 
one of my favorite bands um, is U2, and I want to share a quote here from the lead singer of that group, Bono, on his profession of faith. And he was once asked if he believed in the divinity of Jesus. And listen to his response. He says, The resurrection of Christ is not far-fetched to me. He says, look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a lot to say along the lines of other great prophets, be they Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha, or Confucius. But actually, Christ doesn't allow you that. He doesn't let you off the hook. Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm saying I'm the Messiah. I'm saying I'm God incarnate. And people say, no, no, please just be a prophet. A prophet we can take, but don't mention the M word because you know we're going to have to crucify you. And he goes, no, no, I know you're expecting me to come back with an army and set you free from these creeps, but actually I am the Messiah. So what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah, the risen from the dead, or he was a complete nutcase. I mean, we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson. This man was strapping himself to a bomb and, and had king of the Jews on his head. And as they were putting him on the cross, was going, okay, martyrdom, here we go, bring on the pain. The idea that the entire course of civilization could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase for me, that's far-fetched. So what are you believing in today? Are you believing in the far-fetched views of this world? You're believing about the facts that are presented to us by eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses, and many other facts. So unbeliever, have you put your, your trust in Him as your Savior? If not, well, repent of your unbelief and turn to faith in the one who will judge you for your sins. Let me talk to the Christian before we close this morning. The resurrection of Jesus matters. The resurrection of Jesus matters. You know, Charles Spurgeon, who died in 1892, he said the following. He said, Brethren, this is why we must keep on preaching Jesus Christ, because he was still so little known. The masses of the city are as ignorant of Jesus and his resurrection as Festus was. There are still people today, especially in this city of Abu Dhabi where the Lord has placed us, where the Lord wants us to be, who are ignorant about the facts of Jesus and His resurrection. We need to keep telling others the truth. The world is preaching one gospel, but we need to preach another gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not another prophet. He's not just another good teacher. He is the risen Lord and King of this universe who we will all bow down to one day. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. But some will do it in heaven, folks, and others will do it in hell. They will all give an answer and an account to the one who will judge we need to keep telling others about Jesus. He is the risen Lord. He is the king of this universe. And Paul spent two years in a cell talking to Festus and his wife about Jesus Christ. And we see his heart here grieving for Agrippa. He had the love of God toward men and he wanted, he wanted these unbelievers to, to hear the gospel and be saved. Do you have this love for these unbelievers, folks? Do you love God enough to persevere in your evangelism? We possess the best news in the world. And our love for God and our love for the lost should propel us to share this good news with those who haven't heard, for those who are still ignorant. And love wants everyone to have a chance to respond to God's offer of salvation. This is what biblical love is, folks. Not keeping quiet and hoping that people like you 
because of your tolerance to religion. This is biblical love, sharing truth. Don't give up on your efforts. Christ is worthy. He is Lord. He is not dead. He is alive. And strive to please your master until that day when, when we will hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Father, thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for preserving this portion of scripture for us. We thank you for your word, which is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. Please, Lord, may your word guide us this week as we leave this building. May we not be ashamed of our resurrected Savior who has conquered death and who is seated at the right hand of God the Father and has all authority in heaven and earth. May we proclaim him. May we profess him. May we not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we live lives that would bring you honor as we share the good news with those around us. And may we all hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, if there are there, those amongst us this morning who are are living in shame, who are living in doubt, I pray, Father, that you would take away the fuzziness and the confusion and the noise that this world bombards us with every day. Lord, that we would clearly see that you deserve our worship, that you deserve our affection, that you deserve our devotion. And Lord, that we would worship you together in spirit and truth. Lord, please receive the glory that you deserve today. Save the lost for your glory, Lord. Save the lost. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 